Thank you for joining us here today on From the Heart, where we tell stories of life because life is interesting. Today I have the pleasure of talking with Mr. Lee Habib. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad to jo you joined us today. Um, we're going to be talking with Lee about the different projects that you have going on, but we also want to start at the beginning, back at your beginning. So tell us a little bit about your parents. My mom and dad met in a, in a little town that is right opposite New York City, and it's right next to Hoboken, where Cake Boss is filmed. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's, they were, there were small cities next to the big city, and Frank Sinatra grew up in the town right next to them. And these were row houses, and everybody played on these streets, and very high, dense populations. My dad was the captain of the basketball team in high school. Mom was the captain of the cheerleading team. Oh, they met each other okay. then, knew each other from the time they were five years old, um, and married. And they were basically the, the only... Oh, they, they were their only loves, um, and they never, they stayed married. I grew up in a small town in America, Dumont, New Jersey, in Bergen County, a town of about 18,000, not that much different than Oxford. Um, a lot of great small towns in New Jersey, very, uh, not quite understood by a lot of people that uh, Jersey is the garden state, and a large parts of Jersey are farming communities, and then a big part of New Jersey is the beaches and the shore and fishing. Right. It's a big fishing state. Um, so I, what I grew up with was the Jersey Shore, beaches, um, my father was Italian, my grandfather was Italian, so gardening and being a part of the earth, and then going into New York City a lot to see theater, to see art, to see galleries, and then uh, my, my grandparents were Catholic, so the Catholic Church, though my mom was a sort of a lapsed Catholic, my grandparents were very serious about it, so I was around a Catholic Church a lot, which was right around the block from us, wow. and my, my, uh, my grandmother was every day, every morning, 6 a.m. Mass. Wow. So that was something I just walked her to it many days in my life. Right. When um, you were growing up in New Jersey, did you have any special place that you liked to go? Oh, the beach was it for me. There was, there was nothing happier for me than being in Manasquan, New Jersey, at the beach house my family rented. And it was a real stretch because my dad was a teacher and my mom worked at various retail jobs. Mm -hmm. But they saved up a little enough money with another family. And that beach house was just a, a birthright for us, a little small place. And mm -hmm. we, would, we thought it was the biggest place in the world because we were out of the ocean all the time. Wow. And uh, so, yeah, the Jersey Shore was uh, a, big, a big part of my life as a kid. What was your... Um what is your favorite memory of childhood? Um, just all the time I spent with my dad and my close friends and their dads. It was that kind of a tight-knit place. My dad was a, a superintendent of schools in the town next door. I uh, was a great basketball player in college, and I was a basketball coach in the town next door. And always taught, even though he was superintendent, he always like stayed in the classroom, right. thought it was important. And uh, we would always play with him. Uh, my friends and I would always play with him and some of the other dads, and it would be the young guys against the dads playing right. basketball. And all rules were off. It was like the one time <laughs> we could hit our dads, we could push our dads. It was just ball. Right. And it was, I mean, for years we, we played together, sweated together, and then would have a meal together. And I, I just, that's, that's all you can ask for in life is to, it was a little, little, really an ideal uh, little, little town. Okay. Yep. Um, what is your heritage, your background? Heritage is uh, mostly Italian on my mother's side and mostly Lebanese on my, uh, on my father's side. Okay. Um, the, I guess the melding pot would be New York. Yeah. But I'm sure that spilled over into New Jersey. It did. I mean, where, where they grew up, people were just marrying each other. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to a, there's a great political scientist named Michael Barone. And one day he was saying, you know, because I was asking him about, you know, various groups and how they vote and the mm -hmm. patterns over time. And, you know, a lot of people are talking about this thing called the Hispanic vote. And he right. just starts laughing. He goes, the Hispanic vote? Don't tell a Cuban, a Mexican, and El Salvadorian that they're the same any more than you should tell someone from northern Italy that they're the same as southern Italy. Right. I mean, my grandfather never wanted to be called Italian. He said Siciliana. He's Sicilian. So e even in Italy, to say Italian is a little bit of a, a stretch. And uh, Michael Brony also reminded me that there used to be a thing called the Irish vote. And that's because the Irish used to marry the Irish. But right. one generation later, two generations later, no one ever talks about the Irish votes because the Irish married the Germans and the Germans married the Asians. And there's so much intermarrying in America right. that to simply pick one of the many things you are, mm -hmm. it would be humorous. I mean, for me to say I'm an Arab, it would right. just, I would just start laughing and then my family would laugh at me. Right. Particularly my Arabic grandfather who said, you're not an Arab. I left Lebanon for a reason. Right. It was, de it was a desperate place. And by the way, now that Hezbollah and Iranian mullahs are essentially running 
that great country. Um, it was a very good decision my grandfather made, and my grandfather in Italy made a good decision. Mussolini was coming to power, and uh, he thought it was probably a good idea to get out of there. Oh, wow, well, yeah. yeah. So That's people cool. leave and come here for a reason, mm -hmm. and I wish more people were in tune with those reasons. Exactly. America is a great place, and just because it's um, post 9-11 mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's any different than post-World War II. It's what we make of it. Oh, and, and you know, just as a big student of history, we've never lived in easier and better times. I mean, when you think about what we've had to live through as a country, mm -hmm. the, the ordeals we've had to be through, and we're not a perfect country, and we've made big mistakes, and we've tried to fix them, and we fought wars over some of them. The Civil War was a, an incredible, epic battle, and right. the number of people who died over this in this country is unbelievable. The number of people we lost in World War I and World War II, uh, monumental. All the other fights we've had today, our fights are really little. The screaming's really loud, yes, but, the, but the fight's a little really, really small. There used to be really big fights and the screaming was really small. And this I blame on social media. And well, when the, the closer you are to being together, the more the extremes start to take over in all these debates. So I think the extreme sides of both sides of the political spectrum are hogging up a lot of the, a lot of the spectrum. Right. I had a, an older lady. She was in her 80s. She said the worst thing that parents can do is to keep their children in. Put them outside, let them go to the neighbor's house and play. And somebody said, um, well, what about all the meanness in the world? What if they get picked? She said, those same people existed back in that time, too. And we just didn't make everybody afraid of it. Right. And I would add this, that it's harder to be mean in person than it is in Snapchat. And it's harder to be mean in person. It's harder to be mean in person than to be mean on Facebook. Right. And so social media has given us the ability to be mean without the consequences. Mm -hmm. And to actually get a little following because you're mean. Right. And it's interesting. I was watching uh, Squawk Box this morning. It's CNBC's morning show. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's some interesting people on that show. One of the early investors in Facebook, who's also been an investor in Snapchat and some of the other big social media firms, came out with an article about a month ago saying he doesn't let his kids on social media. So this is fascinating. It turns out Steve Jobs did not. And a lot of these tech titans didn't. And so when he was asked by the guys, what, are you hating on social media? He said, no, I'm not hating on social media. But I just don't think that this is the best use of my kids' time. Right. And so he said, my kids, I tell them to go out and play and scrape a knee mm. and get into a fight and figure it out by yourself. I mean, the stuff our parents used to do. Right. And social media, he blamed the excess use of social media on parents. I mean, look, if you let your kids sit in front of a television set all day, you can't blame the television set mm -hmm. or the TV or the media or the TV producers for what comes out. You got to blame the parents. Right. The TV is not a babysitter. And the day the TV becomes a babysitter, soon thereafter, Facebook becomes the babysitter and Twitter and all the other things. So, I mean, I think a lot of parents are going to have to start to seriously think about the time they let their kids on these, really, on these uh, ecosystems, right. unsupervised and really rough cruel ecosystems where instant gratification rules and the whole thing is wired around wanting to be liked and included and 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 really at one point he basically said that i think human beings are getting addicted to these things physically addicted Agreed. the dopamine is getting released every time there's a cling or a bing and he says why do you think all the bings and all the Institutes and buzzes happen. Mm -hmm. They happen to get our attention away from something human to something digital. Right. And so here's one of the tech titans of the universe saying, my kids don't have a cell phone. By the way, Joe Kernan said, well, what, what age can they get a cell phone in your house? He says, when they're old enough to buy one themselves. And he's probably a billionaire. Right. So interesting. But good good news for middle class parents and working class parents. This is what the really rich guys are doing. Right. Teaching their kids old fashioned values. In San Francisco, no less. Let them go out and play with sticks. <laughs> That's right. Say. Let them go out and play with sticks. <laughs> So, so high school was high school was a dream for me. I loved it. Um, I had great, great friends, good community. I was a, a star athlete in a, in a close knit community, and everybody loved basketball. Mm -hmm. And I loved playing. And I was a captain of the team too, two time in junior and senior year. So I had like a leadership position, which was fun. And uh, my dad taught me a lot about you know how to lead people and how to how to behave and how to how to basically get people to follow. Right. And you get people followed by by being a good listener and being a good servant of those people. So it was just that, that was fun. And then uh, I had a good time taking care of my sister. She she was a musician, struggled in high school, older than she should have been. The girls were mean to her. She was pretty and she was talented and she could sing and, and she didn't have much much of a desire to fit in and you know, be a cheerleader or be the prom queen. She hated that right. she was pretty. She just wanted to play piano. And so we took her into New York all the time. She studied at Juilliard. She studied at Carnegie Hall and she learned how to play and sing and write. And she's been a musician all of her life. And I'm, I'm really proud to say that, you know, 
uh, a couple of us really encouraged her, mm -hmm. whereas some parents would have said, Can we, you got to stay in school, you got to go to college. And my parents, my dad was really smart. He was there, no, her talent's music, and you don't need to go to college to be a musician. And you can make a living being a musician, right. which she's been able to make a, a, a quite a good living. And she lives out in Los Angeles right now in a really beautiful home with a musician husband. And uh, my dad lives with them now. Oh, nice. So go figure. Yeah. Go figure. Um, so by the way, to parents out there, if your kid says they want to be a musician or they want to be an artist, look, it's possible. And teach them some skills on the side in case they have to work, because one day they might have to. But uh, the arts are beautiful, and, and there are people who make a living, and you, you, most people don't get rich doing it. But who cares? Who cares? you gotta, you got to ultimately pursue passions and even hobbies, because what's, what's life worth living for if you don't have... Those kind of things. So I'm, I, I really try and encourage people to always pursue the arts, to pursue literature, to pursue writing, and and they're just great ways to communicate f with people and between people. Love the theater. Where did you go to college at? Went to a little college in northern New Jersey called Fairleigh Dickinson University. Uh, actually, it's pretty big. It's at 20,000 students. Fairleigh Dickinson? Fairleigh Dickinson University. <laughs> and in New Jersey, everybody knows what it is in the Northeast. Leave there, and everybody goes there from either New Jersey, upstate New York. There's like a three Connecticut. Um, private school, mostly a commuter school. Most of the kids there are working class, and they would work, work part-time and go to school full-time. That was back when tuitions, you could actually do that. Right. No one took student loans. I mean, there, no one even thought about doing that. And they weren't even that available mm -hmm. back in the late 1970s, or at least not to anybody I knew, because our parents weren't going to co-sign. Um, and we were pretty much on our own. My mom got a job at Fairleigh Dickinson University, and so all four of us were in at the same time, and all four of us got our undergraduate degrees there. My sister didn't finish, um, but she went about half time. So she didn't get her degree, but she got a, a minor in music and then went on to be a professional musician. Then one brother went on and got an MBA there. And then uh, my parents basically said, you know, you take care, you let us take care of college through mom's work. Right. And then we'll save a little bit up for your postgraduate work if you want to do postgraduate work. And so uh, I then went to University of Virginia Law School. Um, and uh, from there, I just started to get very involved in, in radio and, and public policy. Mm -hmm. So are you a lawyer? No, I never sat for the bar. Um, but I, I, I sensed there was something in law school that I needed to get, which was a good network of people. Mm -hmm. um, who wanted to pursue some of the things I wanted to pursue, which is the intersection of law and life and public policy in life. You know, what, what rules we govern and make as a society and how those rules affect all of us. Right. And uh, it just was always of interest to me. My dad was a history teacher, and uh, I'd first come to Mississippi, actually with my dad, doing a Civil War battlefield tour. And that was just me and my dad. And we went all around the country visiting various uh, sort of battlefields and graveyards. Mm -hmm. In fact, ended up at Vicksburg uh, at the end of one of our last tours together, I think in 1986 or 1985. That was one of my dad went to Gettysburg College. So the Civil War obviously yeah. was a little close to his heart. Eisenhower at the time was living in Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. um, so go figure. And uh, so we got to, he got to see Ike. Well, imagine seeing a general like that, the guy who led D-Day invasion. Wow. That's back when generals were almost, almost gods. Right. And uh, you can't even contemplate what being generals at that, in, in that year meant. And for him, once he learned it, Eisenhower was around in the neighborhood. He goes, that's the college I'm going to. Right. I just want to be able to see him. Yeah. The decisions so. <laughs> that they had to make and live with. and Unbelievable. It really is. And I, I always think about the media. If we had today's media during World War II, it, it, on the battle in the battle of D-Day, where I pretty much knew we were going to lose a lot of boys, right. we were sending a whole bunch of boys onto the beach, and they know the Germans had some fortifications. Mm -hmm. And today it would be Eisenhower lied, people died. There'd be a big investigation, and we'd be pulling back right. after one invasion. I, the, I worry about our ability down the road to ever, ever be able to sustain an actual real war right. against a real enemy, because our media is so hell bent on making sure in the end that our generals are punished. And by the way, it doesn't mean we're always right. I mean, I think Vietnam, we needed to, 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 to look at deeply in what we were doing, and even Iraq. It's not that. It's just that it seems like now every time we ever get embattled in, in, in overseas, the press just comes in and almost it feels like by the end of it that the enemy could actually manipulate our own press mm -hmm. to make our own public turn on our own government. And I think that's actually a strategy that a lot of our opponents have learned from the Viet Cong. Right. And that's something I love. I'm a big student of military history. And I deeply worry that if we were ever to, in the next century, have a large scale war against an opponent like China, and China is not our friend. Um, and you never know what will happen in life. No one could have predicted World War I and World War II in the 19th century. 
Right. I couldn't have even imagined wars of that size and scale, or an enemy like Hitler. You just couldn't have imagined it. Okay. What happens if another guy like Hitler decides to start doing things from Russia out? What if Putin passes the baton to someone even crazier than him? Mm -hmm. What do we do when tanks start rolling across the borders? We know Europe won't resist. And this is not in their DNA. And then right. then we're, we're dragged in. And do we go? Do we stay? Do we watch? Mm -hmm. Who are we if we watch? Um, and what's our legacy? Do, right. we, do we sit out in the sidelines and just say, well, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? Well, you know, we tried that with World War II and they bombed Pearl Harbor. That's right. That's so, right. You yeah. know, it's, it's, I heard an interview one time with a World War II veteran and they asked him what the difference was between World War II and Vietnam. And he said the press. Yeah, I think that's that, that's true. And you know, when, by the time we got to the some of the core, the Tet Offensive, I mean, you know, there were, there were battles we were winning, and we were turning things around. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean we should have stayed there indefinitely? I don't know the answer to that. But did we leave for the best military and tactical reasons? And what happened when we left? You know, we did a story recently here in this studio of a Vietnamese gentleman who, the day our last chopper left Vietnam. All the families were now left to deal with what was the aftermath, right. which was going to be mass slaughter, for sure. Mm -hmm. And so they, 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 that is, he and his, his people decided to just get out onto the water. They'd heard that maybe there was a possibility that some of the American ships out in the, in the water would pick him up. And he tells this harrowing story of floating around for days. And ultimately, some American Marines seeing them, sending off to a cargo ship and getting them on ship and then bringing them there to Fort Smith, uh, to Fort Smith in Arkansas. Wow. And ultimately a Christian couple adopted this Vietnamese family in Minnesota, of all places. Wow. Yeah, great story. And, and he told the story about what it felt like to have the American people abandon uh, the people of, uh, of, of South Vietnam. Yeah. And then what happened with the Cambodians and Pol Pot was captured brilliantly by Sidney Shanberg in the killing fields. I know. You're talking about a mass Indeed. genocide and slaughter, and you can't watch that and think, you know, I, there were some legitimate reasons to protest, but did any of those protesters think about the consequences? Right. And did any of those protesters think about all those guys in Vietnam who died for no reason? In, in their own minds, they died for no cause. What a way to lose as a soldier. Yeah. I died, and we didn't win. Tough, very and, tough. The, the killing fields, someone asked me what would, you know, we needed to pull out of Iraq and Kuwait and Afghanistan and all of that. And they're like, why should we stay? I said, you need to watch the movie, The Killing Fields. Yeah. And, That's why we And we watched stay. ISIS take over. We watched the junior varsity ISIS mm -hmm. take over large swaths of the Middle East for a spell. And then ultimately we sent and dispatched folks back there, our guys advising on the ground and trying to put our, our expertise in place with some of the brave soldiers there trying to defend themselves against radical Islamists. Right. And you got Iraq steady now and people voting. And it's not perfect. But if anyone would have told you or anybody here that people in Iraq would be voting, yeah. it's quite a miracle. It really is. It's quite a miracle. And politicians need to be careful about letting a handful of people that are loud, like, like you said, that are loud, dictate what the American people want. Yeah, I think because, that's right. Because you know, there are more of us that say, leave it alone, than there are talking about getting their feelings hurt and different yeah, things. I think that's right. And, and again, the media has a lot to do with what people think about. You know, in the beginning of the Iraq war, the media was embedded with the soldiers. Mm -hmm. And everybody believed that was such a good idea, because then the media got to see life at least from a perspective of the soldiers. But as that stopped, and then the media started to go right into that little green zone in the middle of Baghdad, mm -hmm. well, then the bad guys started to just, they knew exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. And they knew exactly how to win. And that was, make sure you send enough, enough boys' bodies, American boys' body bags home. Not a ton, but enough in a steady stream for the reporters to finally say this can't, this war can't be won. And uh, so I just worry about that they're fighting a media war, um, ultimately our enemies, and that we're not prepared to not either withstand it or to understand that that's the, that's the new paradigm, that they're very often media wars. That's great. What was your first profession when you got out of college? What My did you do? My first profession, I, uh, I was very good at the L LSATs and the SATs, and so I coached families and worked for Stanley Kaplan in New York and taught kids how to do well on the SATs and the LSATs um, while I was trying to figure out what to do with, with my law degree, mm -hmm. um, which was to go into this area of 
public policy and storytelling, but there were no set paths for this. That was fine with me because I knew enough musicians, actors, where there's no set path. Right. You just had to sort of declare yourself an actor. And I'd gone to acting school and dabbled in that space for quite a while. So I'd met all kinds of friends who ended up being assistant directors, showrunners, all these weird professions that nobody talks about in college. Mm -hmm. um, creative arts directors and advertising agencies, just these really neat, funky lives that had nothing to do with college or anything else. It just happened to be putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. And so that was like a sort of a part-time job that paid really well yeah. and allowed me to just um, help. And then ultimately, I, I worked with a company that trained entire school systems how to raise SAT. So, and I, I owned some some of the part of the software license, and so it was a good good way to make a living, but not be tied down to a any one nine to five desk. So I could pursue writing, which is what I always wanted to do, storytelling, and really writing, telling the story of America to Americans. Because for the most part, um, it's not, American history is not being taught in the in the schools anymore. It's social studies now. Right. Not sure what that is, or it's world history. And I'm going, look, I, I want my kids to learn about the world, but they need to know about their own country first. Because right. if you don't know who you are, how are you going to know anything else? And so our schools have sort of abandoned that, and a lot of our families have abandoned it, and the media has abandoned it. So I, this was a spot that I thought was right for for uh, exploitation and uh, exploration. And that's what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I just didn't know how to do it yet. I asked my nephew, who is 12, the other day, um, has he been studying about the, the colonies yet, the 13 colonies? Mm -hmm. He's like, what's that? What's that? And it was just after Thanksgiving and gone through, you know, the Thanksgiving, um, first Thanksgiving and the Indians and everything, and he was like, I don't even know what that is. I mean, when I was in school, it was Magna Carta, straight through the Mayflower Complex, straight through the Declaration of Independence, to the Constitution. We had to know it. We had to memorize it. We had to recite it in, in our finals. And now this. Um, name how many judges are on the Supreme Court. I don't know. What is the Supreme Court? I don't know. Yeah. It's just, it's tragic. And it's the kind of illiteracy that is fundamentally uh, dangerous it is. to the country. And I think there are reasons. I think there are actually folks who like it that way. Because then they get to make up their own story about the country. Right. So and you can't make up the story of the Constitution. Uh, there's a real story there. And, and by the way, it's an epic story. Those founders who a lot of people now look back on as Western, you know, slaveholders and people who hated women, you can't judge people out of their context. And in that context, the slavery and, 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 and human beings being treated like cattle was de rigueur. Um, people didn't have human rights. Mm -hmm. There were kings. There were dictators. There was no property rights. There was no ability to do all the things that the Constitution allowed women to end up doing, allowed African Americans to end up doing, all these new immigrants to end up doing. Uh, look, it was work in progress, and these were not perfect men. But it, judging them in the context of their times, what they did was absolutely revolutionary. And you don't have to idealize, you know, idealize these men. Mm -hmm. They're not, no one's perfect. But right. the day everyone knows only the bad parts about Thomas Jefferson, and not the beautiful parts, is it's a tragedy that mm -hmm. kids only know our country through its grievances and not through its beauty. Right. I, mean, well, I always tell people, why is it that a, a billion people want to come to this country and not France or Canada or Mexico? And by the way, what are the immigration policies of places like Australia and Mexico and China? And how many people, by the way, have tried to immigrate to China in the past decade? It's so low a number that it's shocking. Now, why is it that human beings don't want to move to China or to Finland or to, or to Norway? And yet they want to come here. Right. Get yourself out of your own situation, look back, see the world from a different context, know what human beings are going through in their countries without a constitution, without rule of law, without separation of powers, with a president who, when he leaves, the next one comes and there's not a revolution. You may not like the next president, but there'll be another one. Right. And we have peaceful transitions to power. We have, uh, we have courts that are not perfect, but the idea that people think our courts are terrible, um, try living in another country and get back to me on our court system. Mm -hmm. That's all I tell people. Go to Cuba, spend a little time there now that you can. Now that you can visit, take a visit, ask a few questions like, when's the last time you've been off the island? Just ask somebody, when's the last time you've been off the island of Cuba? Look at what are you talking about? We're not allowed to leave. And that'll tell you everything. How does that internet work for you? Well, we're not allowed to use it. Ask them how it is to f criticize their dear leader, the Castros. Well, that's not too good. And then go visit some of those wonderful medical facilities. You'll see what socialized medicine really looks like. It ain't pretty. No. It ain't pretty. It's not. So, you know, those are the things I like to ask people. And I like asking particularly young people here on a campus, like at all Miss, when I bump into them. I love just asking them questions. Right. Um, because then, you know, I let them try and fill in the blanks. Okay. 
Um, so I understand that you were involved with uh, Laura Ingram. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, I met Laura in law school. In 1988, we went to law school together at the University of Virginia. We became fast friends, created an underground newspaper together, and sort of mocked political correctness, which was just starting to come in. Here are the right things to think. Here are the wrong things to think. And we mocked it on both sides, because political mm -hmm. correctness and the things you're supposed to say and not supposed to say, really annoying in an academic environment. Frankly, I find them really annoying anywhere. Yeah. There isn't much of anything you shouldn't be allowed to say. Um, and our level of offensiveness should just lay down a little bit, um, because free thought and the free exchange of thought is the most paramount thing in life. And right. um, more tolerance means, in my mind, more tolerance of divergence of opinion, not more tolerance in that we must all agree together. And I think that the tolerance folks use the word, but they don't mean the word. Right. And uh, that, that bothers me. And I've seen it. it started to uh, infiltrate UVA Law School at the time. A lot of the ideas that we're now seeing in colleges across the country were just starting to incubate in some of the nation's law schools. And so you're starting to see re theories like white privilege and, 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 and racial animus. And, and, and you, use the word, you hear the word equity a lot and social justice warriors. And it's all really code for taking money from one group of people and giving it to another. It's wealth redistribution. And by the way, mm -hmm. it's perfectly good discussion to have about whether that works or not, but call it what it is. Right. Call it what it is. And don't call people names because they disagree with you. Don't call people racist or capitalist pig or anything else because you don't know them. Um, and you don't know what's in their heart. And I say the same to folks on the, on the capitalism side. Don't call somebody a crazy Marxist. Have a conversation with them. Right. And there's not enough people willing to have conversations in the country and agree to disagree and then go out and have a beer. Exactly. This is what I always remember and I love the idea that Tip O'Neill and, and Ronald Reagan, two people I really admired, you couldn't have disagreed more politically, but they were very friendly, routinely were seen together having a drink mm -hmm. and Reagan didn't think there was anything wrong with Tip O'Neill the man, he just thought his ideas were wrong. And Tip O'Neill didn't think there was anything wrong with Ronald Reagan the man, he just thought his ideas were wrong and they battled it out on the idea front in the most beautiful way. And I miss that. I, I just deeply miss that. The idea that all of our, quote, political uh, opponents are enemies is despicable. And I saw it in particular when George Bush came to power. I started seeing signs that said, Bush lied, people died. I go, so you think George Bush is killing people? It's the war for oil. And Bush is Hitler. I mean, I just started seeing this stuff. And I just, I've, I haven't seen public discourse like this. Something happened around that time where I just saw Americans talking about their president in ways I'd never seen. And then you know, the Republicans returned the favor talking about Obama in ways I'd never heard people talk about a president. And now, of course, people are talking about Trump this way. And I think it's now just perhaps a permanent part of our DNA. Wow. There's absolutely no respect for the office. There's no respect for transition to power, no matter what the person um, politics is if there's an R or a D in front of that person, that guy's the devil. Right. And that's just, that's tragic. It that's is. tragic. So what newspaper did y'all do, the underground? Uh, it was called the, uh, uh, it was called the Daily Cavalier and, uh, and then they, the Cavalier didn't like that, the official newspaper, so we called ourselves the Occasional Rag, so no one would get confused. <laughs> and uh, the uh, writers were, we were named after legal cases, so we were anonymous, and then we would just sort of, uh, sort of play with, it was sort of the onion before the onion was the onion, and we would make fake headlines, and then everybody got in, you know, not too, a whole bunch of people loved it and thought it was funny, but a certain small group of people thought it was um, incendiary, and actually tried to, imagine this, at a law school, at a law school where you study things like free expression and the First Amendment, we had certain students trying to shut down the paper because <laughs> we didn't identify our names on it. And by the way, if you, know any, if you know anything about American history, the Federalist Papers, our greatest document yeah. was written by someone who was called Publius because they didn't give their names. So we now know who wrote it, you know, and it's Alexander Hamilton and it's John Jay and Madison. But at the time, those guys wanted to keep their name out of it so they could just educate the people through their writing. Right. So this idea of anonymous writing has a deep and abiding history in this great country. Jefferson had papers in his name and he didn't put his name on it. All kinds of people wanted to just communicate ideas and not put their names on it because the name could get in the way. So we didn't want our names getting in the way. Plus we didn't want to get beaten over the head for a joke someone might have been offended by. And by the way, if anybody dared or feigned to even look and find out who did the paper, they could have just asked us. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just fun. And we almost, we, literally we almost got kicked out of the school for that. Yeah, wow. There was an honor trial. I had an honor trial because of this, and UVA has an honor code, and we took them, took the honor court right to court, and uh, got the honor code changed at UVA because it was just some people who didn't like us politically, and they were trying to use the honor code to silence us, and that's not happening. 
didn't right. happen. And I, I stood right in the center of the of the trial and, and took on the honor code and the and the uh, the folks who wanted to shut us down. And that was just a that was a joy because I wasn't going to practice law anyway, so I had nothing to lose. I do didn't care. Do you think that there are people nowadays that are trying to do that with some of this overflow of media, like what's happened at Berkeley and? Oh, I know what's happening. Like I mean, uh, you know, what happened at Berkeley is a tragedy. It happens here at Ole Miss. Uh, it happens everywhere in this country now. There are things to say. There are things not to. There are things to study. There are things not to. If you don't agree with the, with the, with the prevailing opinions, good luck getting tenure as a, as a young faculty member. So speech is being suppressed in very awful and terrible ways. I can't tell you how many students I've met here in Oxford who've told me that they really don't feel like they can give their proper opinion to their professor because they think their professor will punish them. And they don't really care. They'll just say, well, I'll tell them what they want to hear and I'll move on. But that's a violation. It's a deep, for my money, when a kid has to suppress who they are and what their thoughts are because they're worried about what a professor would do to them. If I were a chancellor of a school, I'd want to know that story and I'd want to put that professor on notice. You're, you're entitled to your political opinions, but so too, are your, so too is your student body. And I think it's a plague across, it's actually a plague across this country now, the degree to which there is not ideological diversity. If I showed you the numbers of history professors, I think it's something like 18 to 1 or liberal to conservative now. And the law faculties have just leaned left. And they'll all say, well, conservatives just don't want to be professors. Well, no, we don't want to be professors at places where we're, where we're treated hostily, where we have no ability to get tenure or no ability to advance. Why would we possibly want to work at a place that's hostile right. uh, to people who believe in free enterprise and free markets? And so, or the Constitution and its more, more strict construction, which is a legitimate way to look at it. And it's equally legitimate for people to say, the Constitution is a living document. God bless. But go to most law schools now, and you're not going to hear the what I call the strict constructionist or Scalia side. You're going to hear the more the Judge Ginsburg side as being the noble and good and caring side, as if the Constitution wasn't a good enough bulwark and document to keep people uh, and their rights secured. We need uh, other folks to interpret it more broadly and widely. And look, good, reasonable discussion to have. Not happening enough on campus, and I believe actually it's about to enter our public schools. It's about to creep into our public schools in a very serious way. And that's when I think all hell's going to break loose in this state and many other states. I think the taxpayers are going to rise up and say, you are not going to use my tax dollars to indoctrinate my kids to vote for one political party. Mm. That's not what this is about. We're going to take our tax dollars and we're going to remove them from the public school system and just try and stop us. Figure this out. It, we, we, we think it's important that we have African-American teachers. Very important. We need diversity. In fact, we, we want to make sure that we have lots of women and men teaching. We want to make sure that there's gay, gay members of the faculty. We have gay people in this state and in this country. And we got to make sure we have conservatives, too, because it's half the state. So it would be nice if half the teachers were conservative. So when we're talking about diversity and we're talking about tolerance, let's make sure the most important part of any academic environment is ideas and ideological diversity, because that's what matters most. That's what schools are supposed to be about. And regrettably, I think they're failing deeply at their mission. And I blame, them in, in large respect, the citizens. We sort of know what's going on. We sort of sat on our hands, and we haven't responded. But when we do respond, I think a lot of fair-minded Democrats are going to join us on this, too, because I know quite a number who go, look, this just isn't right. right. Michael Bloomberg's speech at Harvard, Michael Bloomberg is not a conservative, but Michael Bloomberg gave a speech at Harvard where he basically said, in Iraq, a remarkable thing happened. Over 90, when last time Saddam Hussein ran for the highest office in land, he got 90% of the vote. Well, guess what? The faculty here at Harvard voted, gave their money and voted for Barack Obama. 90% of you voted for him. They started to clap. He said, that's not good. I wasn't saying that as an applause line. I was saying that because this school is not dedicated the proof of it, that it's not dedicated to ideological diversity, is you've got a, a, a pool of faculty who are disconnected from the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. Obama won 51, 52 to 48, which means the country is about evenly split on these things. Our faculties should be evenly split. And there's got to be a reason why they're so, not so evenly split, and it's got to be deeply rooted in a particular bias against opinions uh, on the other side of the aisle. And uh, so that, that'll be one of the core things I do as a private citizen here in this state is try and, try and correct that, create a citizen's movement. To me, easy with Facebook, a few full page ads, the right kind of call to action to the state legislature. Um, I'm not going to let my tax dollars uh, be used to turn my, my little girl into a, a voting member of any party. Right. If the Republicans were doing this, I would object.
And I don't want to see the Democrats do it, or liberals do it, or conservatives do it, or Christians do it, or atheists do it. This is, our schools are not a space for outside groups to move in and impose their orthodoxies on, 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 on our children. Right. And this is, I think, is the number one, has to be the number one priority of a superintendent. And I'll be, I'll be letting my local superintendent know about that. And we've already had some discussions. He knows. I don't think he likes that discussion. I think he thinks I'm a, sort of a pain in the butt because he's got lots of problems. He's doing a great job, and he can only do so much. He needs right. the backing of the people. And I've promised him one day he's going to hear from the people loud and clear. And all the superintendents are, because it's not personal. It's not him. No. It's all the superintendents the state, it's all the people running the four-year colleges. You better start hiring people who disagree with you. Mm -hmm. Get with it and figure it out. And don't tell me how hard it is because you figured out how to plug the holes and all the other diversity features, except the most important, the diversity of ideas. So that's going to be a, that's going to be a, a, a good pet pastime oh, of mine over the next couple of years. I will be interested to watch that. Oh, I'll follow. Oh, will we, we'll, part of it I'll send you the first ad. We've, we've, we've finished the first full page ad. Okay. It'll run sometime, maybe late spring, early fall. When the timing's right and we've got Facebook coordinated because we're going to take the attack to Facebook mm -hmm. and bring out citizens and then we're going to go down to the state legislature and have a conversation and start a very long and ongoing conversation with the head of the education department and a lot of uh, a lot of superintendents of schools. Tell us how you made your journey from New Jersey to Mississippi. You know I, I think there was something about the South that always intrigued me. I mean on my wall were posters of Phil Ford, a point guard for North Carolina, Dean Smith, the coach of North Carolina, Bear Bryant, and Joe Namath. So there's something about Alabama and North Carolina that got me. I loved mm -hmm. Southern writers, so I loved Flannery O'Connor at a very young age. Loved, loved William Faulkner. That's a strange thing for someone in college from the North to admit. But there was right. just something about his prose that swept me in. Um, I had taken those trips with my dad, and I think what really did it ultimately was going to the University of Virginia and living just a little on the outskirts of, of UVA. And at the time, UVA wasn't as big as it was. I think the town was probably at the time around 40,000. I think it's 250,000 now. And that wow. campus sprawled and so did the space. And I would love going out to Crozet. It was about a half hour out. And I just fell in love with the space. And, and it reminded me of you know, my grandfather always telling me what his life was like. And my grandfather, if you know, if you know anything about Italians, but the Southern Italians, they're rural people. And they cook. Life is work, mm -hmm. cooking, talking about cooking, talking about eating and cooking, and then going to church. That's their whole life and family, of course. That's it. That's everything. Right. Um, and big city life to them was like, oh, you don't tell me about Milan, those fancy people up in Milan, not interested, or even in Rome. Um, so it was simple country life, and it had a deep appeal to me. Um, and so when I went to UVA, I, 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 I loved the South, and it was nothing like what I thought it was going to be either. I had, had certain impressions of the South um, that you can't help but form watching TV and movies. And yeah. it's, I think, the, le the last um, socially acceptable form of bigotry is a regional bigotry. The cracks that people make about the South are, mm -hmm. are really remarkable. Yeah, I had a friend at, uh, at the University of Virginia who, who said, come on down to Oxford and watch a game. And so I came down. I, I just love the place. And, uh, and then I came back down again when I came through with my dad. Mm -hmm. And um, I was married with my wife and living in Baltimore doing Laura Ingram's show and a national show out of Washington, D.C. And uh, when we had our little girl, I woke up one day, we'd heard a, a sh some gunshots at night, and then a dead guy was found in the park. And Baltimore's got some really big city problems. Right. And, uh, and so I said, I don't need to be in a big city anymore, given what I do for a living. A lot of it's done on remotes. Mm -hmm. um, let's go move to Oxford or Charlottesville. These are my two favorite towns in America, and I traveled the country extensively. And uh, she's a Mississippi girl. She was born in Biloxi. So she, she and her sister came down to Oxford, looked around and said, looks good. Like six weeks later, we packed the truck. I said, see you, Washington. I said, my little girl's not going to ever have to ask me, Daddy, why are the helicopters flying around over our house? Mm -hmm. Which they were every night in Baltimore. Every night they were choppers. Wow. So I just, uh, we couldn't wait to get out of the city. And that was our excuse. And uh, it's, it's a, we came here uh, almost 13 years ago. And I uh, absolutely love it. Love it. Great. Welcome to Mississippi. Well, we love it. And then we're almost, we're almost allowed to call ourselves Mississippians. We're finding, I think it's 15 years, yeah. you're an honorary member. And then at 20, you can actually say that you're actually a, an, an Oxonian and a Mississippian. So we're looking forward to joining the club. Uh, we know we got to earn our stripes. Good. How did you become involved in your newest venture? Um, I had worked with Laura Ingram right out of, uh, not too far out of law school, and 
we did some TV together and then we ultimately did national radio mm -hmm. and we grew that show into the number one show in its time slot in the country, nine to noon. Laura now has a show on Fox every night at 10 o'clock. So um, the radio then parlayed into a, you know, she's following Sean Hannity, at, you know, on, a, on the biggest TV network in the country and in the, right. actually in the world now. Um, and so I started to work in radio for a bunch of other hosts. Um, and so I went to the Salem Radio Network and st I'm still there um, running content for uh, uh, one of the biggest radio companies in the country. But there was something missing. It was always hard politics. And I'm a storyteller and I love stories and I write a lot of columns and my columns aren't columns, they're stories. Every single one of them is an essay. And it, I, I write the kind of material that anyone who would be a conservative would be happy sending it to a, a liberal and a liberal would read it and send it to a conservative friend because I try to get away from the politics and tell the story of let's say the great Chicago fire what happened after the Chicago fire how did the city of Chicago rebuild itself back in 1871 it, they lost one third of their homes they lost a huge part of their population how did they rebound without the federal government without federal emergency management without Illinois emergency management without trial lawyers without insurance and by the way it's a remarkable story of how these people because they had nobody to blame and nobody to rely with themselves mm -hmm. built that city back up fast hmm. and so some of the deepest reasons why I'm conservative have to do with these kind of stories right. that we can do with a lot more government help than we know we can and we're not victims even when something terrible happens to us and that when you start to treat people like victims they start to act like victims and I know a lot about victimhood in my family heritage and so my Lebanese folks could have stayed there <coughs> But they decided, no, we're not victims. We're going to move, and we're going to move aggressively. So imagine how hard it is to move from a place like Lebanon, not speak the language, and come to New York City. Really hard. Yeah. So when people are living in a certain circumstance, and it's not working out for them, part of me wants to say to them, well, let's move. And they'll look at you like you've sprung a new head, like moving 40 <laughs> miles. I'm saying, right. my grandfather, not speaking language, not a penny in his pocket moved. Mm -hmm. You can do it. And by the way, I'm not saying this punitively. I'm saying this as your friend. If you're in a bad circumstance, figure it out. Save up your pennies and take you and your family and get out of Dodge. But if you're thinking the government's going to get you out of your circumstance, they'll keep you in your circumstance. This is a promise. And this doesn't make me a liberal or a Republican. I'm talking human stuff right now. Right. Do you want to get out of here or not? And how bad do you want to get out? And if you really do, one of the most important decisions you're going to make in your life is that you're not going to want to rely on the government to do that for you. Because you'll have a chance of getting out if you don't. And if you want to rely on the government to get you out, you probably stay in. Yeah. And so those are the things. And it's not that I don't think there should be government assistance for people in need. There should be. But when it becomes three and four generations of the same family stuck in a place, and we know this happens now, we've got to. And by the way, all of us have to take that into consideration of how we can help those families right. get out of those circumstances. And for my money, I watched my dad in the U.S. military. The military gets tremendous numbers of people out of these circumstances. Because the next you know, a kid is not in that neighborhood anymore. His, 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 his particularly fatherlessness is causing so many of our problems. Now, the, the, all those male friends of theirs who were forming gangs, now the new male friends are a new member of a new gang, the U.S. Marines or the Army Rangers. Or, well, that's a gang, too, and they got guns. Yeah. But they're learning, <laughs> they're learning different stuff from these fellows. Right. And they're learning what life is about. They're learning rules. They're learning submission to authority. They're learning consequences for actions. They're learning love of a fellow soldier. And they're getting a college scholarship at the end of the day. And perhaps some incredible job training right. and character training. And this is what I love about the military and sports. No one ever makes excuses for poor kids, white or black, when it comes to sports or the military. All right, come on in. But if you want to go be a sniper, you got to put that bullet through that hole. Period. Because there's no way our guys are going to trust you. We're not going to give you like a little discount because you, your mom is single mom and you don't have a dad. No disrespect. We're going to treat you like everybody else. And I've always loved the space that coaches have to treat kids, no matter what their circumstance, the same. Mm. And never, ever do you hear a coach say when a kid has poor circumstances, oh, you poor, you poor child, you don't have to be in shape today. Right. Does any coach say that to a kid? Mm. Absolutely not. And I think this, 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 this diminished expectations we lay on our kids who have poor circumstance is the worst thing of all. I call it the bigotry of low expectations. And we're doing it particularly to our poor kids. And the poor kids need our tough love more than anybody. They need us to keep raising the bar. We can't tell them they're stupid. We can't tell them they can't do things. And we can't have them blame their circumstance for why they're not doing things. We've got to help them. But we also got to teach them to help themselves. 
And I don't think there's enough of that going on with our at-risk kids. We're going to stop here for right now, and um, we'll come back on our next show with Mr. Habib. And we hope you will join us then here on TV 99 North Mississippi.